I'm Eva Fried. I'm the clinical director here. Caitlin, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hey, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Caitlin Rivard, and I'm the clinical advisor for the midwifery and the women's health program for the students kind of east of the Mississippi. So it's not an exact science, but we kind of, there's kind of a line there that we divide it by. So if you're in the eastern, southern, south, eastern, north, any anywhere east of the Mississippi, I'll be glad to see you. And I'm usually, for everybody on the call, I'm usually fairly able to keep up with the chat at the same time. I will tell you if I'm like falling way behind, but um, you're welcome to ask questions verbally. So don't be shy. I'm not going to just try to torment you with PowerPoint. Like I want to respond to the questions that you all have, but you are welcome to put things in the chat. And those of us from Frontier who are on the call will respond to them in real time or sometimes we'll, you know, say, oh, that's something we're just going to respond to verbally. So you don't need to like sit on your hands until some special Q&A later because the Q&A starts now. Um, but I will start with some slides that have big picture questions that that folks tend to be interested in that we want to make sure that you know. So we can go ahead and advance, Rosalie. Okay, so I'll let you read um, the mission to yourselves, but um, in in short, um, many of you are probably here because you're interested in our mission, which is particularly those in rural and underserved communities. Um, but there are certainly individuals who are in need of our care anywhere that we go. And this is a picture of actually two things that are special at Frontier. One is something that we call circle up and you don't have to touch. These people all were happy to lock, lock arms, but if you're like, I'm not going somewhere that I have to hold hands, that's okay, you don't have to. Um, so uh, circle up is a way that we build community that um, creates a scaffolding to support you even when you're working in your home community on your studies. And this is also the pavilion on campus where we ring the bell to celebrate um, different um, specific timelines in your journey towards your goals. So a couple special things represented here. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, as you all probably know, most of your education at Frontier takes place at a distance, and that's purposeful. We started distance education before there was even, you know, home internet. Um, so the idea was that midwives and nurse practitioners would be trained in their home communities so that their home communities would have a new midwife or nurse practitioner. We didn't need, um, at the time, um, Hi, I couldn't think of the name for a second. I'm so stuck on Versailles. At the time, we're in Versailles, Kentucky now, but we didn't need Hyde in Kentucky to have, you know, 4,000 new nurse midwives and nurse practitioners. We needed those folks all over the country. So we found that if people trained in their home community, they stayed and served their home community. And so that was really the origin of our emphasis on distance education. So you make two trips to Versailles, Kentucky, one at the very beginning and another one at the point between your classroom coursework, which we refer to as didactic, and your clinical training. And we'll talk more about that in the program of study. So two trips to campus, um, and we really focus on making those something that couldn't possibly happen over Zoom because we know that there is expense and time away from family involved in making those trips, but we really believe and student feedback uh, reinforces that those times on campus really scaffold all that time away and keep you from having that sense of isolation that you know could otherwise be possible. Next slide, please. So um, if you can believe it, we've been doing this for more than 80 years. Um, students and alumni in every single state and many places around the world um, this number is probably higher now of currently enrolled students and many thousands of graduates, many of whom will be preceptors, um, and some are now faculty, for those of you that are interested in starting your journey as a student. Um, lots of great awards. I have sweatshirts with all of these different logos on them, and I'm proud to wear them. True story. We've gotten awards for our diversity efforts, being a great place to work, 
and uh, really being a strong leader in distance education. So who's there for you? Like if you're home at a distance, are you just like you and a computer? And if you need help, you're like texting an IT person? No, you've got this whole universe of um, real life humans that you connect with. Um, and this is in no particular order, um, but you've got regional clinical faculty who that's the team that I lead. Those are the faculty that take care of you in the clinical portion of your program. Um, of course, your preceptors when you're in the clinical portion of your program, academic advisors and clinical advisors. So Caitlin, who's on this call is a clinical advisor. So part of her job is helping you set up your clinical experience um, and make sure that's going to work for you. And then your academic advisors, that's a role you're probably familiar with from your undergraduate education, like people who help you modify your program of study. Um, and I see the question in the chat. I'll get to that shortly. Um, lots of mentoring groups. There's folks that work in financial aid and admissions. Um, we have a great library. As you can imagine, almost everything is available online. We have three full-time librarians who are happy to meet with you and help you navigate that system. You're really not just like out there with a keyboard. Um, we have a diversity impact program. And in our courses, until you get to clinical, there's no um, synchronous element to the courses that's at a specific time of day. So it's not like you have to like go to class, like you're here now. It's not like every Wednesday at five, you have to be online for the classroom portion. There will be um, elements that you have to be online at a specific time for in every course, but those are posted at the beginning of the term. And there are selections many times throughout the day and many days of the week, because we know that one of the reasons people choose online education is that they're working. And we know a lot of nurses work at night and they have family responsibilities. So you will have choices for when it works for you to participate in those experiences. So the only times you need to be available at a specific time consistently is when you're choosing which weeks to come to campus. And then when you get to the clinical portion of your program. So I should, even though it'll be on a future slide, I'll just say right now that our program is set up different from, or differently from most um, advanced practice nursing programs, which is that you do all of the coursework. So pathophysiology and pharmacology and advanced health assessment and the management courses for your specific track. So antepartum care, uh, postpartum and newborn, gynecology, all of those courses are done first. And only after you've completed all of that, you make your second trip to campus and then you just go to clinical. And there's coursework and a faculty member and all of that stuff involved in clinical, but the going to clinical part is separate from the going to courses. You're not like in your gynecology course and doing gynecology and clinical at the same time. So for the most part, um, both students and their preceptors find that to be beneficial because the very first day that you go to clinical, you're prepared with everything you could possibly do. Of course, you don't know how to do it all yet because you're still a learner, but you've been introduced to all of it. So I'm going to pause and come up for air and respond verbally to what I see in the chat and give you all a chance to kind of digest what you've heard so far. Um, we do accept students from Arizona. Our only limitation is New York State. Um, we, it, the state of New York limits the number of students that um, can be accepted at a school that's not brick and mortar in New York State um, for midwifery specifically. And we do have post-master's programs, both for midwifery and for women's health. Um, I will say that um, the requirements to do a post-master's program anywhere, not just at Frontier, have changed dramatically in the last couple of years. So even though there's a tremendous amount of overlap between the midwifery and women's health nurse practitioner roles, um, 
you can expect to have to do a lot of things that may feel redundant, especially in clinical. So I don't want that to scare anybody away from asking questions. But if you know someone that was like, I had this one degree and I came back for six months and now I have the second degree. I'm not ideologically opposed to that idea, but it has been a journey with certification bodies to continue that. Um, so yes, and I will concur with Caitlin in answer to Sierra that yes, you don't have to go to clinical in the state that you live in and you don't have to do your clinical all in one place. There are some things that we ask you, some things are required, like you have to have an RN license or a compact license for every state in which you do clinicals as an advanced practice nurse. Um, and there are some people that require you, we require you to communicate, but yes, you, you are not limited. And that's common that people are like, I need to go where my parents are so they can help me with childcare or something like that. Um, can you enroll as non-matriculating? That's a good question. I don't think so, but an enrollment coordinator would be the person to talk to about that. And if somebody else on this call knows the answer, please reply. Otherwise, um, you will have access to enrollment coordinators to talk to after this call. Dr. Freeman, able... yeah, that that class is available as non-matriculated. Oh, thanks, Bobby. Okay, no good thing there's so many of us on the call. Okay, so Jennifer, yes, you can do that. Um, and then if you applied for admissions with any class that you had previously taken, then the program director would do a gap analysis and look at what you'd already completed and you can apply for that credit to count towards your um, enrolled coursework. Um, it's not so much that there's a wait list for New York, it's about how many we take each term. Um, is there anybody on the call that wants to speak more to the special New York situation? I can. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in New York State, we take six students between the Women's Health Program and the Midwifery Program per year. So it starts August 1st and goes to July 31st. That's kind of the rolling year that they look at. And there are six different students that are able to complete their clinicals in New York State from both the Women's Health Program and Midwifery. So it's not many per calendar-ish year. August 1st to July 31st. Now, if you're a New York student that lives close to a state line, that is always an excellent option. We have many of our students um, just cross right over the state line and, and complete clinicals and then come back to work in New York State because we know that some of the most innovative and progressive midwifery midwives in the world practice in New York. <laughs> so we'd love for you to bring your education back to the state that you're from, but it's limited to six per year. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah. Have a quick, yep, go ahead. I have a quick question. I do live in New York, but I'm also close to New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. Is New Jersey, are there any restrictions on New Jersey? We love New Jersey. <laughs> 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 yes, it, exactly. So if you're close to a state line, really shouldn't be a problem for you. It's not that you're not going to be admitted as a New York student. It's just that, you know, if you're not one of those six, you won't be able to actually conduct clinicals in New York. So I'm going to. Oh, OK, uh, thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, thanks for the question. And thanks, Caitlin. I'm going to chime in and catch up where we are here. Um, so somebody had a question. Now I've replied so many places, I have to get to where I left off. Um, the path from being a certified professional midwife to a certified nurse midwife. So um, we 100% take into account the experience that you've had in that circumstance. You do need an RN license still, and there are no other changes to the coursework. So people come you know, to nurse midwifery with all sorts of backgrounds. So the background as a CPM is obviously enormously beneficial, but it doesn't relieve any of, of the courses in our program. Um, okay, answered that one, answered that one. Restrictions from California. New York is the only state that has restrictions. So nobody else in any other state needs to be worried about a state-specific res restriction. Um, Lisa says, I know you don't have the dual program, but what would it look like to do both? As I said earlier, that is becoming a more complex journey um, because of requirements of state boards of nursing and the body that credentials women's health nurse practitioners. So um, I, in my understanding, 
few, if any, schools are still offering the dual. And if they do, they're usually a BSN to DNP, and you can fit all that dual in in the much higher number of hours required for um, the transition from a bachelor's degree to a doctoral degree. So I'm happy to have more one-on-one -on -one conversations about that, or if we have more time at the end of this meeting. The other question is sort of kind of ideologically, why do both? Sometimes it's economically driven, depending on where you live or what your long-term career goals are. Um, but a lot of people, if you're thinking about doing both, can find that your goals are met with um, doing the nurse midwifery degree. Um, with a post-master's, is there a good transfer rate? There is a limitation, a good transfer rate previously taken classes. There's a limitation on the number of credits that can be transferred no matter where you go. Um, for a postgraduate program, but we do make a modified program of study, including the clinical requirements that make as much sense as possible within the confines of any graduate school that's going to issue you a degree is going to require a specific percentage of the courses be taken at that school. Um, so I don't think that you'll find it to be different than, you know, another similar school. And we would absolutely modify. So like, say you're an FNP and you're coming for postmasters, like, we do modify, like you don't have to, you know, go see hundreds of primary care visits. Like we want to make the most sense of your time here. Is the university catalog available for viewing uh, if you're not in the frontier community? Great question. Does anybody else on the call know the answer to that? Do you believe that the catalog is actually only accessible if you're admitted? Um I will check on that. And if you just want to pop your email into the chat here, I will get the answer to that and get back with you. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh-huh. Um, the next question is, do you have to reapply for the DNP program after completing the WHNP program? So that really, the answer to that depends on when you complete the WHNP program, um, because that is like a little bit of a shifting environment as well. Um, so right now, if somebody, if any student who's been successful in a master's level program essentially has guaranteed admission um, to the DNP program for a certain period of time following completion of the one program, um, it's no longer like one fluid thing. So you do reapply, but you're essentially guaranteed admission if you've been successful in the master's program. I can't promise that, you know, for somebody that enrolls for late this year and then takes two years to complete the master's, that that would still be the same situation. But we're definitely in the business of helping people be successful in meeting their goals. Um, I mentioned that women's health postmasters has changed over the years. Does that mean it will affect the chance of admission? Can you tell me more about what you mean? Feel free to unmute and just uh, respond. I think that's from Ting. Oh, hi, Dr. Freud. Um, so sorry. Um about confusing. So what, okay. I, what I'm trying to ask is, um, because you mentioned the um the woman health postmaster like mm -hmm. has been changed over the last several years. Yeah. Um, I just don't know at, at that point because I'm I'm getting my FMP and I'm I'm about to graduate, so I I don't know what's the chance um to to like get into. I trying to apply the fall semester like this year. Um, I just want to know, like, uh, what's the chance um, I, I have to get into the oh, yeah. woman it's health not, um, it's, as opposed to master? Sure. And definitely circle back if I don't answer that question um, in the way that you're asking. But I think the I think the answer to what I'm understanding you to ask is it's not going to affect the chances of admission. It's just that if you know somebody that did a postmasters like maybe two years ago, the postmasters looks different now than it did then. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit more laborious, um, but again, that's that's based on what um, in state boards of nursing are requiring and what the body that certifies women's health nurse practitioners, which is called the NCC, what they require. Mm -hmm. right. um, but when you meet with an admissions counselor and when you look at our programs of study here tonight, it'll reflect what you could expect when you um, apply. Okay. Um, the next person says, is there any flexibility for frontier bound if the student has the circumstance to attend the bound? I'm not 100% sure what that means, but what I there are multiple dates to attend frontier bound, and then there's multiple dates to attend clinical bound each term. 
So we work with you to find the dates that work for you, but everyone is required to come to campus for both of those. Um, and we do have accommodation, you know, for people that require any kind of like disability accommodations or anything like that. We certainly um, have those. Um, clinicals have to be, oh, I see our answer has to be in the U.S. Okay, I have MSN and public health. Um, so you can, just like anyone else applying that already has a graduate degree in anything, you can certainly apply to have those credits count towards something in your master's program. Um, the difference between public health or some of the other masters in nursing other than advanced practice nursing masters is that so I wonder if some of those courses would actually count more towards the DNP than towards the master's because the master's degree is very focused on providing care to an individual rather than care to a community. So I don't know what there would translate, um, but you're certainly welcome you know, to request a review. Um, how strict is the one year of RN experience? Um, yeah, with what you said, Heather and Aaron, just go ahead and apply and we would take all that into account. How do you accept transfer credit for advanced patho from another university? You So, Emanuela, you, um, there's a process once you accept admission. Uh, if you were to have an offer of admission and then you accept that offer of admission, then there's a process where you submit your prior coursework and, and request um, credit for that. Are you responsible for setting up clinic for yourselves? I know Caitlin already replied. Um, so yes, yeah, students are, um, you know, the experts in their own communities and we have faculty in most states. We have regional faculty that specialize in the clinical portion of the program, as well as, um, clinical advisors, including Caitlin, who are not physically located in other parts of the country, but have an expertise on, um, clinical preceptor availability around the country. And then we also have something called the community map, which you can utilize to start, start your journey. Uh, okay, Bobby answered the next one. Do we have to come to Kentucky? Yes, you have to come to Kentucky twice during the program. Um, is ADN to MSN an option? Yes. Isn't that amazing, Jennifer? We are unique in that way, that if you, you need an RN and a bachelor's degree. That bachelor's degree can be in nursing. You can have a BSN that covers both, but you can have an RN and a bachelor's in, I mean, my first bachelor's was in gender studies. Um, so, and I went to school with an RN and a bachelor's in gender studies. So absolutely. Um, would we just apply for the postmasters? Well, you're going to get a sneak peek of the program of study, Amanda, here shortly. Sorry, my cat's feeling feisty. Um, You'll get a sneak peek of the program of study. You don't need to apply to see the program of study. We'll get there tonight. How strict? We talked about that. Active duty RNs and clinical locations. Unfortunately, we are not currently offering the opportunity to do clinical on an international military base. Um, but we are extremely accommodating if folks need to take like extended leaves from school when they're deployed and that type of thing. But um, if someone is domestic, are there any hurdles in terms of clinical placement um, and possibly um, what that would look like in terms of being on base or not? Help me understand a little bit more about your question. Um, so if I have an act, like if I have a RN and I'm active duty and I'm practicing as a registered nurse on a military base yeah. mm -hmm. and I can get clinical placement on a military base. Oh, does yeah. we do that all the, the time. Frontier. Oh, okay, great. We, yeah. We the, have lots of sites on our community yeah. map, Casey, that are on military bases. We do. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no worries. If you see the site and you can act, you only have to be able to access the community map once you're enrolled, but if you see the site on the community map, there's a good chance we already have a contract with them. Um, but the only thing with military sites is, as you can imagine, if you're in the military, contracts take a long time. And so we just want to get those started sooner rather than later. Um, required trip to campus, uh, you pay a, min a nominal fee. It includes your housing and meals. But if that like totally creeps you out and you don't want to stay on campus or like you want to bring somebody with you, you can request to stay off campus, but that's at your own expense. Um, no, Danielle, a, your 
Uh, a curriculum vitae it tends to be for folks who have some experience with scholarship. So meaning that you've got like presentations or papers that you've written, that's uncommon for folks that are applying for a master's. That's more common for people applying for a doctorate. So you can essentially uh, consider a curriculum vitae and a resume to be equivalent for your purposes. And no, we don't trash your resume if it doesn't exactly fit the format on the website. So nope. Just show us who you are and, and why you're interested in coming to Frontier. Thank you for the engagement. I know I'm a fast talker. I am going to pause and breathe and tackle a few more slides, but keep the questions coming. Okay. Rosalie, if you're still with me, thank you so much. Okay. This goes, there was, you know what? There was one question I forgot to answer about scholarships. Um, so you cannot apply for scholarships right at admission. You have to earn um, a few terms worth of credit hours to apply for scholarships. Next, but we do have lots of scholarships for students. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talked about, and Lisa, I see your message in the chat. I'll pop back over there shortly. Um, so we were talking about student support for clinical a moment ago. And now we are talking about um, student support kind of getting to clinical. So um, this is about, we do have a couple of different teams that support you identifying your clinical sites and with all that documentation. So back to like the question that Casey asked, like Casey's not going to have to create a contract for a military base to sign. No, 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 not at all. All she has to do is tell us where she wants to go. And somebody there said they would take her. And we've got teams of people that um, do all of that for you. And we just ask you to be an active participant. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so some of the faces that you'll see on your team, usually Dr. Thrower is here with me tonight, our department chair. And, but she is traveling home right now from a conference in New Orleans. So she wasn't able to be with us. Um, and so she oversees the whole department. I oversee the clinical program uh, for both for both women's health and uh, nurse midwifery. Um, every course that you take in the didactic or classroom portion of the program has a course coordinator who's responsible for all the content in that course, um, as well as course faculty who oversee smaller groups of students so that you got, get a lot of engagement. Um, your regional clinical faculty is going to be your faculty for all of your, once you are in clinical with your preceptor, you have one faculty member who's with you for the duration of that time. And that person is your regional clinical faculty. You'll have a clinical advisor, as Caitlin said, she'll be with pretty much all of you that are east of the Mississippi, um, and you've got an academic advisor financial aid officer, credentialing coordinator, and then uh, Zach, one of our librarians, his picture's just here, even though it doesn't say librarian on there, but Zach is so darn nice and tireless and will meet with students literally 24 hours a day. He knows that some of our students are stationed abroad during the didactic portion of their program. And he's like, just set up a set up a meeting with me. It's okay if it's at four in the morning Eastern. So he, he earned his spot on our slide here. Um, next slide, please. Okay, true story, story of my career. You know, you get on your little bike, here I head to the finish line, but really there's this whole obstacle course in between. Um, true story, but that's why you've got this whole team to help you on this journey. Next slide, please. Okay, so kind of getting to the nuts and bolts of what you're all wanting to know. We offer three degrees here. We offer the... Um, regular master's, a postgraduate certificate, which is for people who are already an advanced practice nurse. So there's other things you can have a master's in nursing for, but if you're not an advanced practice nurse, you wouldn't be eligible for the PGC. So you need to be a nurse practitioner or a nurse midwife um, to be eligible for the PGC. And then, um, oh, I guess I'm wrong. I guess we still have direct admission. You don't have to reapply um, after being successful in the master's with the DMP. Um, so right now our terms last, I guess, I don't know why I said right now, that's not changing. Um, our terms last 11 weeks and then there's two week break between terms. So we still have four terms a year. Um, 
and the master's takes two to three years, depending on how many courses you take at a time. Postgraduate, one to one and a half years, and the DNP takes one and a half years. Next slide, please. So admissions criteria, active RN license, bachelor's in any field, minimum of 3.0 GPA, good academic standing, one year of RN experience. But if you've been a CPM or a doula or you know, a couple of you asked that, um, don't be too worried about getting that one year. Just apply. Um, we do require a uh, COVID vaccine to come to campus. Although I see somebody asking in the chat, I didn't get over to everything in the chat yet, but um, you certainly can apply for an exemption for that. I will say that if you are not um, vaccinated, it can be more challenging to find a clinical site, just as you may have found as a nurse, if you're not um, COVID vaccinated or uh, able to get the flu vaccine, you certainly can anticipate some additional challenges. Um, but you can certainly apply for an exemption for coming to campus. And we talked about New York. Next slide, please. Um, talked about that. I think I've covered all that. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, I talked about that. I have a tendency to just know what's coming and I just say it all. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to pause here and go back and uh, tackle some stuff in the chat. So Lisa asked, um, what kind of tutoring or editing support do you offer? So we do have tutoring. Um, as you can imagine, most students take advantage of that during pathophysiology. <laughs> that tends to be the most challenging course. Um, and we do have a variety of options. It's not like in your bachelor's where there was like a physical place you could go that was like a writing center. Um, but we do offer tools like Grammarly that you can access um, for free via the university that can help you with editing. Um, okay, yeah, so that's my answer to that. Um, if you stay off campus, I see Bobby answered that um, we do still actually require you to come to meals on campus because your day is full on campus, uh, becoming part of the community. So you're not, you don't have to sleep there. You can request an exemption to sleep off campus. But I think I'm merging the words exemption and exception into like one word. So you all know what I mean. Um, but yeah, so that's why we still require the fee. Do you stay with your cohort? So Heather, um, that varies because as you saw, it can take two to three years to progress depending on how um, how quickly folks progress. So if you start with a friend and you both take the same number of credits every term, then yes, you would stay with your cohort. Um, but not everybody does that. Um, typically where you make your really strong connections is, I mean, you, people make connections throughout the whole program. But the group that you come to clinical bound with tends to progress together. So when you come to frontier bound, there will be multiple specialties on campus at the same time. Like there'll be people doing psych mental health and family and, you know, women's health at one frontier bound. And another frontier bound will be, you know, midwifery and psych mental health or whatever. So you'll meet people there who will be your buddies during the didactic for sure. Because again, in, you know, pathophysiology, there's folks from every track. Um, but when you come to clinical bound, you're on campus for a whole week and it's a deep dive specifically for your specialty track. And those folks will likely progress along with you for the final like six to nine months of the program. Um, okay, Bobby responded to that. The three P's for people who have not gone to graduate school before in nursing, that's um, pathophysiology, pharmacology, and advanced physical assessment. Um, and yes, uh, you can you can request um, for those credits to be accepted from a different school. Um, just to follow up, the restrictions from New York are we can only take six students a year. Um, from New York. Are there normally issues with exemptions for medical documentation? Um, so again, just to respond, Sophia, uh, I wouldn't be too concerned that you wouldn't get an exemption to come to campus. Um, but clinical sites have their own rules by facility. 
And so it certainly could present a challenge in terms of um, clinical site requirements, similar to what you'll find, again, working as an RN in terms of the requirements to get an annual flu vaccine and to get a COVID vaccine. Um, okay, somebody has already, congratulations, already received an offer, but wants to connect after the session. And I'm wondering if you mean specifically with me, because I think you might have asked about midwifery versus WHNP. So I'm going to put my email in here. Um, and you are welcome. If we go to six o'clock tonight, uh, which we probably will, I would love it if you can just email me and we can set up a time to talk. And that goes for any of you. That's my email address. Um, if I start full time, oh yeah, as Bobby said, we're wild over here. We know everybody's working and has families and their spouse gets deployed and their preceptor breaks their leg and all the things. We're all about helping you make it to the finish line. It's going to look like that picture that we showed you, but it looks that way whether you come to Frontier or not. And here you've got a whole team to help you navigate that obstacle course. Can clinical hours be completed? Blah, blah, blah. Um, sorry, Jennifer, I didn't mean to blah, blah, blah your thing. But, uh, it depends which program you're in. Um, in midwifery, the uh, certification body for midwifery requires that the vast majority of your hours be done with a certified midwife or certified nurse midwife, but there is some flexibility. In women's health, there's a ton more flexibility. And again, that's because we have, you know, accreditors, certifiers, and state boards of nursing, and you need to be prepared to uh, jump through all those hoops. I've applied full time. If it's too overwhelming, can I switch? Absolutely. And then you can switch back because we're super flexible. Okay. Next slide, please. Application deadlines. This all you can see online. And of course, we're forthcoming about what it costs you to attend the program. Next slide, please. And I see your question, Erin. I'll pop back there shortly. Um, when you get to the clinical portion of the program, you will need a minimum, whether you're a master's or postgraduate, you'll need a minimum of 750 clinical hours. Um, and no one is going to be done in 14 to 16 weeks. It's just that we want you to know that like, it's not okay to say, I have somebody that will let me work 24 hours a day. So I'm going to be done in five minutes. You're just not going to learn that way. So I've never had somebody <laughs> suggest that they could possibly do 750 hours in 14 to 16 weeks, but we're just letting you know, even if it was humanly possible, that's going to be a no, because you need to like integrate what you're learning. Um, and midwifery in particular is also has visit type, actually they both do have visit type requirements as well as competency requirements, which means that you need to meet the minimum number of hours, you need to meet the minimum number of visit types, and you need to demonstrate entry-level competency. Those things are all built so that the three things are meant to happen in unison. So it's unusual that you would have one of those things done and not the others. Um, but it isn't just, I did my 750 hours, so now sign my paper, bye. You have those three things that you have to achieve, but they occur in concert together. Um, Lamaya is asking, is there a certain number of hours each week? Yes, there is a minimum number of hours each week um, that depending on which portion of clinical you're in is going to be between 20 and 30 hours a week. You can go more, certainly. You can be like, I'm taking the summer off from my job and I have childcare and I want to go 45 hours a week. We will discuss. Um, but the minimum is between 20 and 30, depending on where you are in the progression. And Aaron's question is, what kind of support is there to prepare for our exams after graduation? There's an entire course for that. So you're prepared throughout the program, but then uh, there is built in at the very end of the clinical portion of your program, your last term here, you will take a one credit hour course that is specifically to prepare you for boards. Is it possible to work full-time? Yes, um, it is possible. I would... Uh, not encourage it if you also have a lot of family responsibilities. Um, but it is it is possible and lots of people do it. Yes, including the clinical portion. Next slide, please. Oh my gosh, now you get to ask questions. I, I've been blabbing. 
Um, so hit me with some other questions that you have. I, this is Danielle Lockett. I cannot text fast enough. I'm a very slow texter. So <laughs> um, if you don't mind, I would like to ask my question. Um, what tips would you give um, your future students about um, balancing the work, work life, as well as um, work life and school life? Yeah, so, um, right. So this midwife one is specific because you like go to school at night and then you work at night, right? Where that's less common for somebody in a WHNP program um, and a WHNP lifestyle. Um, so my tips would be to expect it to take up an enormous amount of time in your life and be pleasantly surprised if it takes less than that. I've been to graduate school three times in my life. I homeschooled four children. I have six. They're all adults. I've lived to tell. Three of them were born while I was in my first master's program. Plus I already had one. So I had four, four small kids in my first master's. So I say all that to say that Two of the times I went to graduate school, I was like, you know, reading a textbook with one hand and changing a diaper with the other. Um, and only the third time did I finally figure out that like I needed to have dedicated time and surviving is not the same thing as, you know, thriving and having the time for really the joy of the education that you're paying for, by which I mean, you hear something in class and you're like, that is so interesting. I want to look up more about that rather than just, I'm going to do as little as possible to survive. So I would just expect it to take up a lot of room and be pleasantly surprised if it doesn't take up as much room in your life as you expect. Is that a reasonable answer to your question or is there a piece I missed? No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Um, Okay. I have a question as well. Yeah, go ahead, Erin. Um, I am hoping to be a midwife for Doctors Without Borders, so I'll uh -huh. be uh, traveling, working in all kinds of settings. Mm -hmm. um, for the clinical aspect of the midwifery program, mm -hmm. um, is it mostly in hospital is, or is there a good variety so you can kind of experience a lot of different ways of being a midwife? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So one of the things, and for those of you on the call interested in community birth or out of hospital birth, or some of you said you might be a certified professional midwife, um, you're definitely coming to the right place. We have on campus, we have three birth simulation rooms, uh, one that simulates home, one that simulates birth center, one that simulates hospital. What you do for clinical is largely about the pieces that you put together for you. So if you want the vast majority of your experiences to be in an out of hospital setting, you can set that up. Um, we require a minimum of eight births in hospital simply because we want you to be a marketable professional. And that's where the majority of births take place right now. If there were enough births occurring in a community setting for us to require every student to have eight of those, we would. It's not, it's not that we feel ide an ideological leaning towards hospital and not the other. It's just there, there aren't as, I mean, like 1.5% of all births take place in a community setting. So you can certainly um, orchestrate that for yourself and we can help you. Um, but not everybody will have the same clinical experience based on their own, what's available to them and what's important to them. Um. Okay, I'm popping back over here. Is it possible to work full time? Can I take one class sometimes? Or, okay, so for Jennifer, um, some of that is going to depend on your financial aid status. And um, we allow two, somebody else jump in if I'm saying this wrong, but I think we allow two terms off per calendar year. As um, long as they are not consecutive. As long as, okay, thank you so much, Bobby. So yeah. yeah, you could take, like you could take off spring term and then you could take off fall term, but you'd have to go in summer. Um, is there an opportunity for further training? Yes, all those things, Sierra, those are the things you listed. And then the other ones I would add would be like circumcision. Um, I don't know what else is coming to mind, but ultrasound, uh, first assist, 
operative first assist, colposcopy, and circumcision are all considered, um, they call them expanded skills for some reason rather than advanced skills. But those are things that you actually cannot get trained in. Well, you can get trained in them, but you can't do them while you're in school because they're not considered part of um, entry-level skill set for a nurse midwife or a women's health nurse practitioner. But absolutely, there's training available for those things after graduation. Um, tuition payment, that's really about what works for you. Loans out of pocket, um, financial aid, there's government, there's government loans. Some people now find that private loans are better. Um, there's lots of different options. School will help me find a site in the state where I live, right? Yes, we will help you. We don't promise that you don't need to travel further than is comfortable for you, but no school can promise you that. But absolutely, we help you and we have faculty in almost every state, including Arizona. And I think that's where you said you're from. Do we provide our own lodging for on-campus days? No, we have, um, we actually call them lodges. We have buildings on campus where you can stay. Since there's no longer a dual degree option, what's the best approach <laughs> or the path of least resistance? Short story, the best approach, approach is to do midwifery first. Um, but this is one that often takes a whole separate conversation, um, which I'm happy to have, but I'll put my um, email in here again. Uh, and we can have that conversation because a lot of folks are like, I just don't know what to apply for to start. How long are the on-campus stays? Frontier bound is two and a half days and clinical bound, I think is five and a half days. Absolutely, Jay, um, you can do clinicals somewhere that's not currently on our community map. That's wonderful. Just bring them to us and we'll figure it all out. Um, can a nurse midwife, is ECV external cephalic version? I think that's what you're asking. And I think that um, that depends on your facility. And I'm very triggered by that, y'all. I'm just going to say, because that was worse <laughs> than labor. And I'm like, Caitlin's not a midwife and she knew what that stood for. So there's a backstory. <laughs> okay, Caitlin, we'll, we'll hug after so we can kind of decompress. Um, okay, I've been doing research about midwifery. There's a higher hospital mortality rate and complications here in Florida. 100%. If there's not more uh, expansion of midwifery in the future to address the maternal mortality rates, Josette, then somebody's not listening. So yes, none of you are going to have trouble getting a job. Do we provide resources for external scholarships? Um, I'm not sure. And then I'm going to say, uh, Maura Lockie, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. I was putting it as a reply to those particular people. So it is up there in the chat, but I'll put it out here for everybody to see too. Thanks for that question. And your financial aid advisor can assist you with um, like securing some external scholarship opportunities if you're interested. Okay, great. Um, I can't remember. Are there more slides? If not, I can answer some of these other questions. Oh, this is our cute campus. It's so pretty. It has acres and acres of walking trails and there's food 24 hours a day. I am somebody that like panics about access to food when I travel, but your badge will swipe you into um, the dining hall 24 hours a day. There's always ice cream and vegetables and salami sticks for those of you that want to eat that instead of ice cream or vegetables <laughs> there's and then there's um three hot meals a day okay other questions that people have Um, other questions at other slides at all, Rosalie, because then I'll, I'll tackle this why midwifery versus WHNP situation, unless somebody else. Oh, Lisa, that's a great question. What are we looking for in future students? We're looking for future leaders. And that doesn't mean that you have to be extroverted to be a leader, but somebody who's going to go out and show the world what a nurse practitioner or a nurse midwife can do and take care of their community and the folks in their community. And Caroline's asking, I applied, when would I hear back? And also, what's the best I timeline to apply? 
yes, I was just going to reply in the chat, but I can just reply this way. Um, so once we receive all of your application materials, so that's your application, um, your resume, your essay, your license, your transcripts, um, your application gets submitted to the review committee, and then you typically get a decision within about four weeks, and that comes through email. And then what is the turnaround time, best time to apply? If you hope to start in the fall, when should you apply? Um, so application, um, opening dates, deadlines, start dates, it's all on um, the website, but just something to kind of help you remember is that um, whenever a program is, or whenever a course is starting, that application opens up about six months before it and closes about three months before it. So for fall classes, they start October 7th. So that application opens up on April 4th and the deadline to apply is June 26th. Um, so you wouldn't be able to apply until the application opens for fall. If you were to start applying now, the system would assume you were applying for summer since that's the op op excuse me, open application right now. And then Bobby, can you take the next question about number of applicants and I'm gonna start to answer the other ones in the chat. Yes, so there is a maximum number of um, applicants that they can accept per term, and a lot of this has to do with those campus visits. Like we mentioned, um, students stay on campus in those um, lodges, so there's only so much space. So a lot of that has to do with the space for those campus visits. So, um, and it varies term to term, um, how much space they have in the program. You think about, you know, how many people have graduated out, things like that. So, um, yes, there are certain numbers um, that can be uh, admitted. I'll just stop typing and thank you. Reply verbally to Josette's question about can a spouse attend campus orientation? So they cannot. Um, they can come on campus to like see it, but they cannot um, sleep on campus or attend meals. And the reason is um, not to be like, no, you can't come here, but to foster the connection among students. Um, so, but some people do choose to stay off campus so they can stay overnight with their spouse or whoever else is accompanying them. Um, and yes, thank you, Caitlin, for responding to Sophia. It is complicated, Sophia. Um, and I, I think that you're asking like, what if you already work in that setting um, and you're not trying to go there as a student? Um, but basically that's something that you could, you're welcome to reach out to me and we can talk about it because you might need to decide, right? Like what can I do in terms of my livelihood while I'm also in school? So, um, you know, we try to be reasonable. So feel free to email me and I can help you figure that out. Um, okay, Heather has waitlist questions. Okay, it looks like the next two are for you, Bobby. Got it. All right. So for the wait list, um, you can be on the wait list up to two terms without it expiring. So basically, let's say somebody applies for summer term, um, they get waitlisted for summer term, um, admitting for summer term is done and they are still on the wait list, they will be moved to the fall wait list. Um, you'll get an email asking you to um, say, yes, I do want to move to the fall wait list. So you would have to reply to that. Um, and then if you did not get admitted from the wait list from that second term, um, then your wait list would expire and you would need to reapply after that. Um, it's people are admitted um, in an order. So when they put them on the wait list, um, they are in a specific order based on how their application was reviewed. Um, so people get admitted in that order. Um, finishing my BSN, graduate in May, two class for summer term. It's 6.30. Okay, so with the with the application deadlines, um, they are hard deadlines. We have to have everything, including um, official transcripts with the conferral date and the final GPA on them. So if you were completed by 6.30, our fall deadline is June 26th. Um, so you wouldn't be able to apply for that. You'd have to apply for um, the winter term, which would start in January, and that application would open up June 27th. Ashley has a good question about if I start part time, how many hours a week should I prepare to dedicate towards schoolwork? So there is it just depends. Part time means different things to different people. So there is a formula for how many hours per credit hour you should expect to do homework. But I would not come back to school unless you think you could spend at least 20 hours a week on school, um, because between attending class, 
preparing for class, doing the homework and preparing for what's to come in terms of like the clinical portion of your program and that type of thing. Um, and the fact that we all think we set aside 20 hours for something, but some of it gets eaten up by something else. I think that I'm, I'm making that up on the spot, but I think that's a reasonable starting place for like, do I have enough time in my life to go to work? And that doesn't mean that you only work 20 hours a week. You might work 40 hours a week and have two kids and a parent that you need to help, but could you pull 20 hours a week out of your life somewhere? Like, is there a part of your shift as a nurse that you could do some studying? What kind of support do you have on the weekends and evenings to help facilitate that? Um, do you value study abroad experiences on a resume? Sure. We value the whole picture. So, you know, share anything. Um, finishing BSN, graduated in May. Um, yeah, so Bobby's going to go over that with you because we want to make sure that when you're applying for makes sense in terms of that one year of RN experience. Oh, but you probably already have an RN. You're just doing the BSN. Okay. Um, Bobby, can you respond to Lamaya? Um, just to clarify, if I'm a summer wait list, are you considered for the fall term first? Um, they do tend to, like when the when they start admitting for that next term, um, they do tend to try to admit some people from the wait list right away um, before they start reviewing um, applications that have just come in for that term. Um, me, myself, I have not seen any kind of rhyme or reason to it, so I don't know if there's, you know, a, a policy that gets followed or steps that are taken. Um, but there are, they do tend to take some people from that wait list and offer them um, right away once that fall term um, starts admitting. Okay, and we just have a couple more minutes. So what else do people have? Oh, you've got the other emails here. Um, the bottom there. Oh, one more question about how the wait list works. Yes. So if you are waitlisted, um, I'm using summer and fall as examples again, um, since we're doing summer right now. If you are waitlisted for the summer term, um, there is still a chance of being admitted for the summer term. It just depends on spaces that open up and things like that. Um, you know, people that maybe um, accepted their offer previously can't attend now. So uh, then a space opens up. Um, if you do not get admitted from the waitlist for the summer term, and it's your first term on the waitlist, um, your application will be moved to the fall term term. Um, it's basically moved automatically. An email comes to you where you have to reply to it and say, yes, I'd like to be moved to the next wait list. Um, but it would move you to that uh, wait list the second term, and then you have the chance to be admitted for that term. Um, that second term, if you are not um, admitted and st you're still on the wait list, your wait list expires, and then you can reapply after that. Is it more difficult um, to do midwifery if you have not worked in labor and birth? So I, um, I was a CPM. I did not have labor and birth nursing experience, but obviously I had experience with labor and birth, um, just not in that RN role. And, you know, it's interesting. There's not an easy answer to this question. It can be a little bit of a different journey finding a clinical site. And that is really because, um, I'm just going to be honest, the nature of what midwives do has shifted a lot. Um, and in some ways, that's really great. A lot of us work in higher acuity settings. And so that labor and birth nursing experience can really come in handy. But it can also be really challenging for folks who have spent a lot of their career in that setting and are now thinking about like, what is physiologic birth? What does birth look like without interventions? So I don't want anyone to think you have to have that labor and birth nursing experience because you definitely don't. Whatever you bring, I mean, ICU nurses and emergency department nurses bring amazing things to high acuity settings. And then lots of midwives work in low acuity settings. Um, but I also just want to be honest that throughout the duration of my career in academia, I have seen it be differently challenging for students who don't have that background to secure a clinical site, especially at some of these really high volume hospital sites. So, um, do not be deterred. Um, and we now offer actually, it's currently covered by a grant at no cost to the student. I think it's a hundred dollars just to hold your spot. We offer an intensive labor and birth experience connected to the time you come to campus for clinical bound. So it doesn't cost you anything more in terms of travel uh, for folks that don't have that experience. Um, okay. And it's six o'clock, but why frontier over a different university? I have to answer that one. 
um, you become part of this massive community that is national and international with um, an incredible history and an incredible future. Um, and your your experience will completely be scaffolded by the people that you meet here and the experiences you have on campus. You might be literally alone studying at home, but you will not be alone in the big sense. Um, so I know it's six o'clock. If folks need to sign off, they can. I will stay on and respond. Um, make sure I stay on until everybody's off. Um, New York is limited because of the state's own restrictions. It's, it has nothing to do with our restrictions. Yeah. So um, go ahead and feel free to sign off if you're done. I want to thank my colleagues who are on here, uh, Rosalie from Marketing, Caitlin from Advising, and Bobby from Admissions. Um, we're all really grateful that you all took time to join us this evening, and we, we hope to meet you and get to know you. Can't wait to work with y'all. Oh. See ya. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. And I'll just stay on so that I'm the last one here in case anybody needs anything. <laughs>